Oh yeah. Welcome back to the podcast. It is Tuesday, April 30th, and I'm so excited to bring you this episode. I had a chance to sit down a couple weeks ago with Mr. Felix Peralta and Mr. David Barclay Gomez. It was awesome to get into their brains and talk about music, talk about coming clean, getting sober together, and rededicating themselves to the music, and how much they work. In my opinion, Felix and David are two of the hardest working guys in town. And when it's your day job, you gotta hustle. I'm excited to share this episode with you. We did a lot of music playing, which I love. So I'm gonna put some of it here at the beginning, maybe sprinkle a little bit within the episode, and then play some more at the end. I hope you enjoy, and I definitely recommend you going out to check them out anytime you see Felix y los gatos. Are you gonna jam with us? Yeah. <laughs> I was waiting I've been crying down in East Mexico Was cheated I was lied to 
singing, I was crying the blues. Up to your opa, baby, me and you With Mr. Felix Peralta and Mr. David Barclay Gomez. What's going on, guys? How's it going? Hey, what's up? Welcome to my garage. <laughs> Welcome to Hard Talk Music. It's great to see you guys and hang with you guys for a little bit. Um, how the hell has the music scene been treating you guys, man? You guys have been playing a lot, as you guys usually do. Or I was mentioning off air that you guys are probably the most hardworking band in town. Well, yeah. You know, you got to hustle some money and we love to play. Music is our day job, so we got to hustle. Now, we were, <laughs> we were talking a little bit about what the, the most amount of gigs in a time period was that you guys had done. And you said five gigs in a day. Five gigs in one day. That's our record. Yeah, I, I probably don't really remember it. It was like, <laughs> it was like you know, it was a little while ago. It's when we were catching that first wave of... Are po- you know getting popular? Right, in right. The, in the you scene. know, even seeing that from a distance though, and just like watching as y'all's friend to uh, see you guys posting about playing every single day of the week. <laughs> you know, That's always like, fun because you like go to bed and you're like, yeah, oh, man, you know, there's no gig tomorrow. Like, Wait a minute, there's a gig. <laughs> <laughs> Other things to look forward to. And yeah. Yes. Or yes. you don't have a gig and you're like, oh, finally a day off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of cool too. Yeah. Get yeah. everything done. It's good to be uh, yeah. to recharge. You know, yeah. charges. So how soul. did how did you guys initially start playing together? What was that story like? Well, I was playing a. It was a college party. Yeah, it was, it was like a, a kind of a. What is what do they call it the there? Student ghetto. Yeah, the student ghetto there, and, and uh, it was, I think it was Halloween. Was it? Okay. I remember I was wearing these cool checker pants. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I wear them now, they'd probably laugh at me, but. <laughs> They were cool then, for sure. But yeah, I was playing as a three piece, and then Dave was like hanging out. I was with, I came with my friend um, Jason Boudris. Um, DJ. Yeah, DJ Out of Space, DJ A Sun One. Um, we had a little group together called Tactical Cactus, and we were doing good. Uh, we played a few gigs. We won the Mike Awards one year, and. You know, we were, it was a long time ago. We were doing great. And then, so that, if that's the case, and that's when we met. So I think it was 98. Yeah, it was at my friend, uh, our friend Tiffany's house. What? I think it was 99. It was 98, 99, because we were doing that. Because I know that, because the next year, because the big Y2K thing, end of the world, we played New Year's Eve at Pearl's Dive. So then we met before that. Though. Yeah, we met before that. Hmm. But it was this party at the uh, student ghetto, big old, I mean, the floors were like... Floors were moving. Move the, you know, cave, you're not caving in, but bending. Yeah, hardwood floors, and you feel bending. bending. considerably. Wow. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that was a good and I party. got there with, yeah. my, with, uh, with Jason and walked in there, and we were like, all right, cool, we're just jamming. And the band is playing band. And I was like, man, I should bring my keyboard in. I have my keyboard because we just did a gig or something. Then I said, jam nights on Sunday, man. No, you didn't. <laughs> I walked up and I said, uh, hey, man, I got my keyboard. You, you got to let me jam. He says, okay. <laughs> no, he's, he's like, sure, go ahead. He said, who's the leader of the silhouettes? <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, so I went and got my keyboard, set it up, bam. And back then, I didn't know how to play. I, I you know, I, I was, it was a lot of heart and no... You well, know, you had it where you could you know, yeah. move it for each key. I had the keyboard capo, you know, where you push the, uh, you know. 
Transpose key. You transpose, <laughs> transpose key. I call yeah. that a keyboard capo. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in C. <laughs> no, E flat for me. Nice. Everything was E flat. The black keys with that one little white key, you know, blues. And so but I yeah, the blues we scale and I was just spending a lot of time, you know, doing that. And so I was not that, but, you know, I was getting pretty good. And so when I jammed with them. We were already a jam band yeah. at the time. We were just kind of I just say, what key? The A and more. All right, A, let's go. <laughs> yeah, we just kind of jammed. But it, it was a jam kind of jam. Well, that's back then when it was jamming was religious. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was a spiritual yes. thing mm-hmm. where you're just like, this is jam. This is my prayer. This is my, you know. Yeah. So that kind of thing of, of Felix and I were kind of the same. Right. And they're in all in their band too. With uh, I think it was um, was it Valente, Valente Garcia. I think on bass, yeah. Ruben Castillo on drums. Yeah. I think yeah. maybe Ruben. Yeah, I think it was Ruben too. But we used to use a. It was always like Kerry Cooper was around and. No, but not then. No. Nope. It was kind of the old schoolers. It was a way old school. And, uh, but we rocked it, man. Fucking all night long, bam! I don't think we even took a break. No, back then it was no breaks. We used to pride ourselves. Just on like, give me a beer. No breaks. <laughs> play for five hours, you know, just <laughs> continuous. Yeah, but uh, that was it. And at the end, bam! It was great. It was happy, you know, and went over set with Felix and them. Mm-hmm. They're like, all right, you're in. <laughs> You're in, man. We're starting you're in. the band. I remember the, uh, you and Ruben looking at me. You're in. I was like, all right. We had a little conversation. On, okay, and then, uh, what do you think? I'm like, yeah, all okay, right. man. <laughs> we voted you in. So that was cool. And then we started meeting over there at, uh, I don't know, you were rent- you had a house with, uh, with, um, with he had one- his travel or the, yeah. the international. Tim. Yeah. Were you with Tim? Yeah, we had a house with just a skateboard ramp in it, and there was no furniture, really. No. It was like maybe a chair. You had a house? All right, now back up. Tell me about that house. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a house right there, you know, off of uh, 4th Street and like Hazel Dean, I think. And it was just a uh, wood floors, nice, kind of run down, you know. Yeah. But it had a skateboard ramp. We had He put a skateboard ramp. Tim used to skateboard a lot. And, it's kind of just chill and jam. This guy that plays bass, Tim, that mm-hmm. that I met recently, right? Tim Gonzalez or is different Tim, Gonzalez? Yeah, yeah, it's Tim Gonzalez. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We've known him for that long. Wow. That's I know awesome. him before you. Well, <laughs> yeah. his family knew my family. I met him day, at a so. punk rock concert at a garage concert. It was for Permagrin. That was way back. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And Jose. Jose? Jose Ponce. Yeah. yeah. He was a good friend. Yep, him, him too. He was part of that punk Moved kinda. to Seattle. And then I met you, and then found out that you guys know each other. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, it's that same crowd. Right. You know. It was kind of a small kind of jam scene back then. Now, beyond the house parties, what was what was the club scene like back in the 90s and in the 2000s? And, cause I, I thought it was okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, we didn't get as many gigs as now, that's for sure. No, well, I mean, we do the next month we got a gig. Yeah. <laughs> right. Let's practice. Right. But I used to work at a, he started working there later too. I used to work at Brewster's. It's a bar back, so we'd hear a bunch of music there and start going oh, to the yeah. jam. And you and you'd go to the jam. Um, yeah. Sunday night jam. Huh. And also the, what was it Thursday or Wednesday? Wednesday was the happy hour with Milo and friends, so that was a big inspiration. Oh, so that bar was downtown. Yeah, yeah, that's where, where was the that library bar? is. Okay, all right, that's where the library is. Yes, yeah. yes. Steve Figueroa, Milo used to do that gig. Oh, it right? was a great. Playing Coster, it was, all I mean, guys, it was right? awesome. It was like on their their pretty much their prime of like there was a vibraphone player that come. Yes, he had just came back from like Cuba. Wow, and, it was great. Oh man, really inspired us and inspired. made us want to play we wanted to play up there and then we did play brewster's uh, um yeah we did play one night up there remember yeah we had i carried up that big ass keyboard up there and we had a jam we did it mm-hmm. there remember it was With towards the, the end before they almost that, closed that other gonzalez the hair or was that paul gonzalez Paul Gonzalez. that's remember. right trumpet player paul gonzalez no, no. guitar player blues but paul okay. gonzalez the trumpet player wow yeah he was very we, very inspirational back then 
Because How so, man? He was he was inspirational for me too, man. I, I was just talking to him yesterday about yeah, just the flow of his you impact. know his his leads and just the way he just you know I I've always got inspired lead wise not from guitar players more than more like horn players, you know, mm-hmm. just the way they phrase things. Mm-hmm. This is always I've always liked. So that was that was big time then, and then uh, Diego Adencon. He Maestro was, drummer, yeah. Yeah, he was. Badass. They used, used to play Greg Ruggiero. Oh yeah. So he was Luis Guerra. He used to give me lessons. Like that was like some of my first guitar lessons. No shit. Figueroa. Greg, Ruggiero Greg was. Ruggiero. Yeah. Figueroa was in that. Steve too. Figueroa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Figueroa. Then they had a place across the street. And they'd go practice. I remember that. Yep. And we go to check wow. them out sometimes. Wow. It was like a little uh, office loft area. Where mm-hmm. they were, practice i thought that was like the coolest thing i was like that's yeah. what you do that's you made it that's it that's awesome yeah man yeah, have have no, that's like in the, what's your stories you hear and you or when you read about like new york and the scene and there's this big old loft scene and there's just people just hanging out and you know what i mean and yeah. that kind of view is what it looked like it looked yeah. cool yeah. But with, with nobody in it though it's just <laughs> yeah i think kinda downtown kind of created changed and Kind of for the worst, more you know, and then it was pretty wild back then. Yeah, the Dingle Bar, and and there was more music though happening. I would think, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot more music happening downtown. Yeah, I agree. There definitely are because that was the clubs beyond ordinary. Remember that? Yeah, there was big bands there, and of course at the Dingo Bar, and. um, Launchpad, I think it just opened. Was Pearl's Dive. Pearl's Dive was fun. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, there was a few others. Forgot their names. Yeah. I remember those days back then. I used to go to G. Willigan's. G. Willigan's? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? A restaurant? It was, it, was a, it was a bar, and they kind of you know, hired a lot of metal. metal well, acts. that was kind of the end of the... End of the... The rock, the hair band, hair kinda. band days, because it was a, a senior buckets and all those. Mm-hmm. My brother, I'd hear about those places, but uh, I never really went. I did work at Grand Central Station as a bar back. At Grand Central Station, mm-hmm. the one over on San Mateo. And no, it was Montgomery. Where was oh, it? Oh yeah, it was, no, it was Sa- San Mateo and McLeod back McLeod, then. McLeod, sorry, right? That okay. was uh, no. Then that, that wasn't that. That was. Uh, Midnight Rodeo? Midnight Rodeo. Oh, it was called Midnight Rodeo, yeah. Wow. But they had like five different areas of music. That was my that, that was the thing that always impressed me the most about hearing about that place was the fact that they had that many different like what what was it? It was all these different rooms, four different rooms, right? Yeah. Tell me about that. What the hell was that like? Yeah, working yeah. at a place like that. It was crazy. Which I, bar would you work at? Which area I'd, would you work I'd at? go like through all of them. I'd, you know, give beer over here and then take some you know, bottles to the, the the western cowboy area, and the, then there would be a wet t-shirt concerts going on in the rock area, and uh, <laughs> it was pretty cool. But uh, everything changes. So, moving into moving into like formally uh, um, starting to record. What when did that happen for you guys? What was what was going in the studio for? Y'all first like, was like when was uh, that? It was in Santa Fe. It was it was in like somebody's kind was, of house studio. It was uh, John Gagan. John nice. Gagan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Badass Gagan. bass player. Yeah, and he's actually on a couple of tracks. Wow. And it was with um, Diego Aragon actually oh, wow. did a track. And then Charles Crawford, right? Yeah. Oh my God, that was on the first bass. time they wow. they had met and played together. And it was uh, great. It was really cool. It was, was you know, kind of telling Felix, like, like you don't have to play. <laughs> <laughs> just let them do you it. You just man. let them do it. And every once in a while, I'll go. Ew. And, a, <laughs> and a lot of those songs, a lot of our fans, you know, from nowadays, they they, they haven't even heard those. And I want to release something cool, like a, you know, just release a CD, just be like whatever. Yeah. It's, it's songs from back then. You guys probably do. And that's when I, I was first uh, yeah. starting to hang out with him and jam with him a little more and so i was on that too I yeah well we did some cool polkas yeah we did a couple of polkas and then i remember myself really in the background of um damn shame yeah it's just all <laughs> <laughs> damn shame's the one with diego on and Char- uh, charles crawford it's it's really nice 
That's on YouTube, isn't it? Ah, uh, no, no. But we need a. I'm gonna put that one up for sure. I want to make a video for that one. So what year was that when y'all first did that? Yeah, I, I think it was, uh, that was a little, six. Yeah, yeah, that was later. 2005, at least. So you guys had already been playing together for how many years? At least About five years. Yeah. We were hitting the blues jams. That was our thing. It was the blues jam every week. Yeah. We'd go to the blues jam. And then go to the parties associated with the blues jam. Now, let's talk about the blues jam for a second. What is the attitude of, 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 of uh, what was y'all's attitude going to the blues jams back, back in the day? It just for me, for me, it was very. It's like the movies for me. It's like this is a blues jam, you know. Yeah. This is whoa, okay. I'm checking it out, you know, because I'm a reader and I, I'm an avid reader. And back then, I really read a lot. Kind of romanticized it, yeah. I read <laughs> about sure. these jazz guys and these blues guys, and so you get this big image of your head of what music is, you know. And right. you're like, I want that. So you hit the scene, and you're like, wow, yeah. this is it. This is all the players here. This, you know, yep. you know, and you see the cool guys and not so cool guys. You're like. I think I could fit in, right? You know, <laughs> it's like inspirational to, to those. I call them. I don't even call them dope blues jams. It's like the dojo. You know? Yeah, where you, you kind of cut your teeth and learn how to play with a band. But we met a lot of friends that we still yeah. have today. Totally, you know, it's yeah. good friends and lifelong friends in the blues scene. It was it was good, man. It was definitely a you know a learning experience. And I still try, you know, I go to some of them. I know you still play sometimes. And or host them. Yeah, oh well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just did. Just the other yeah. Day. We're hanging out with all the blues guys. That was cool. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what it means to you guys to be playing music for a living. You know, was this something both of you guys thought you wanted to do from young, you know, young age? Did you guys always know you were in no. for this lifestyle? I didn't start really. He started later. He started like 27 or something. And that's how that come about? Yeah. I just... At 27, you said. Yeah, I was... I loved music. Totally loved it and idolized it, mm. romanticized it. But I never got into it. Mm. Yeah, maybe had a little bit of... Um, if I picked up a guitar, I could probably do something. But uh, there was, it wasn't until um, that I got here to Albuquerque. I remember... Listening to the eighty nine point nine, the blues, some blues. Yeah, thing. and I heard. Um, I heard some um, live bands playing. I heard Albuquerque Blues Connection. Right. Mm. On the radio, and it sounded awesome. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? I think that's when the club rhythm and blues was happening. Right. Which was a cool, you know, Carl Allen. So it was a scene, right? definitely a, yeah. a scene happening, and then some good music good so then i you know got a keyboard and started fiddle faddling with it for years and finally in albuquerque i was kind of like all right i want to go meet some people and just do something right what about for you i was playing i think like by 15 you know because my grandpa played accordion and then my uncle diego played guitar but of course it was more new mexico you know, rancheras and stuff like that. And then my cousin, who's 10 years older, you know, he, he was in bands and he was cool. And uh, so I started hanging out with him and just kind of strumming some acoustic. Back then, I really liked acoustic, and I thought I would, uh, you know, that's the only thing I would play because I was good at, like, strumming. So I, I really liked Richie Havens. <laughs> hmm. Richie Havens was one of my idols back then. No shit, okay. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And the laser guitar, when did that come into the picture? Then? I'd say later. I'd say uh, I'd say at least 21, you know, another five, six years later. I got, like, my first Strat. And even before that, I had a cool Guild acoustic, and I put a pickup on it. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, this is cool. Yeah. And kind of with a Marshall amp. Acoustic electric. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was cool. But uh, yeah, Strat, and then next thing you know, I had a Mesa Boogie amp, and then uh, just a Strat. I had a Strat for a long time, <laughs> and uh, I missed that Mesa Boogie. I wish I never got rid of it. It was a really nice one. Good clean and good distortion. 
there's a lot of gear that goes I'm sure in a lot of pieces yeah. like, that they're like yeah. why did I that I wish that? I would have <laughs> held on to right <laughs> yeah but yeah it keeps on keep on grooving so something that has it inspired me a whole lot through different aspects of uh is my life is hearing about y'all's um y'all's amount of time that you guys have gone clean because you guys lived quite a lifestyle mm. um really hitting the lifestyle hard. yeah you know what i mean the musician lifestyle of like boozing drugging you know it's it I seems think we were partiers at yeah. that point i came to a point where we were partiers more than we were musicians it kind of happened gradually we do we did talk about that like when we first started rehearsing we just go to the store and buy like a tall boy each and be all right that's it that. i remember <laughs> that's all we needed a quart of carta blanca yeah a quart of carta blanca and like a okay. joint and, and that like, was it. And I was like, man, wow, cool, man. Be like, all right, was, see you tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was it. That was not. That was nothing. That was all you needed. Yeah, I think it. You know, it just kind of kept progressing, and yeah. other drugs and the scene. You know, with the scene comes, you know, some other bad drugs. Yeah, we got caught up. And then, uh, you know, I look back and I still think I was kind of romanticizing the, yeah, man, Hendrix did it kind of thing, you know, or whatever. Yeah, we all did. Right. As we all as we all do when we read about yeah. stuff yeah. as kids, right? Yeah, as or kids. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. As then, an adult, you're like, well, actually, I tried that. <laughs> that that's not, that's not, doesn't feel that great. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's like, well, you just, I'd rather be known as for the music right. more than the, the party and... That's what it was at the beginning, you know, was that. And then the, the drugs take over and you don't even see how or why or whatever. It, takes, it, it just does. And you think you're being cool. And you just think cool. you're all the same. But your mind is constantly the same. But all the stuff around you is changing yeah. slowly but creeping. And before you know it, you're kind of oh, sh clawing your way, trying yeah. to make it back to normal normalcy. Yeah, and, you know, to, to be able to play music five nights or four nights a week you got you know business wise you know the owners don't want to see that you know they want to see you you know talking to the people or just okay you know you know alert and so i went from that couple quarts of beer to what like i could, <laughs> I could down a pint <laughs> yeah of vodka a pint a of pint vodka. in the morning to kind of feel normal you know, just a not a half normal. pint, not a half pint. <laughs> Boom! No, oh, you take a swig. The first swig is like a, a half pint. Yeah, clark, 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 I think I'd know? be able to do a half pint like pretty much in two two chugs. Is what it was. Oh yeah, I'm just then bam, and then just some with a glass of water. And they're like, all right, well, yeah, okay, and that's enough to get you normal. And now you can party. Now you can, yeah. Start having fun. Start having fun. <laughs> wow. Because you just kind of feel normal. Feel normal. <laughs> very, very sedated, but normal. Wow. And yeah, I mean, I look back at some of the videos and, you know, some of my fans now that don't know, didn't know me then, you know, they would, they're like, I could never see you that way. That's weird. Which is really cool. I feel that's a nice feeling. That's awesome. But uh, they, they, true fans of your music. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they're like, Oh yeah, I've heard some of your videos uh, from way back then. And live yeah, I guess stuff. for That's people that. that are looking at us from afar, they're not gonna see any of that. That was more of the insider kind of right industry, you know, where right. the but it's it, all the all the manage all the bar managers and owners talk to each other, right? Right. You know, and it's it's getting farther away where people don't they just know us as the music now it's again, been which three is good. Years. Yeah, three years. Three years plus. Yeah, a little three years and plus. And uh, I feel great. Yeah. <clears throat> so walk me through a little bit of what was that straw that broke the camel's back? Because this is two of you guys in the band. And this mm -hmm. is two of you guys that are clean for that long. Mm -hmm. and so what, what, you know, what was that transition like? I mean, what was that, that 
we period. were just like, not. We were just losing yeah. all our losing all our gigs. Everything was going downhill. I was I was getting sick. We were getting kicked out of bars. We couldn't come back to like it was like ten bars. <laughs> yeah, kicked us out. Damn. Yeah, and uh, and then it was started where we couldn't you know play and it was pretty much it was like being a heroin addict man all you wanted to to do is just your next fix Mm -hmm. seriously that's how bad it was you know and uh all your friends around you're like they don't want to hang out no way or you couldn't find a rhythm section or right or you can't play you're on stage and you can't you know can't play either because you don't have anything in you or too much (laughs) or too much right wow so yeah man and started getting sick and so they've been being broke 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 and the shakes oh um homeless damn yeah yeah homeless pretty much um and then you know yeah i was getting the shakes and i was you know we played in chicago once and uh oh yeah we were in chicago and uh uh, I didn't have any alcohol like all throughout the day, yeah. And then I had like a seizure, right before we were supposed to play. <clears throat> I was like having—I had a shot in my hand, and I was about to do it, and I. Fucking... You said your hand was shaking, and all the stuff was falling out. <laughs> yeah, and then, <laughs> and then next thing you know, I was in the hospital, and then uh, then they took me back and they put me you know some B vitamins and blah blah so blah. So me and Fred Lopez had to do the gig. <laughs> yeah man wow. after that it was just you know I had got oh, sick man. again and no. you know, it was just just done man Where? how far can you go really right. well you know right. dying <laughs> right right how, yeah. how much can your body take right? but yeah. we didn't look at him that way we looked at him like you know angry at him yeah we were angry at you because you were screwing everything up when we were too i mean come on we were not that we were the same but we didn't see it like that you know what i mean it's I just your brain mine yeah you know course, you know there's a lie that yeah. you, you've told yourself yeah that you believe and uh and so but then then following next couple months or few months that's when we got word that felix is in the hospital and yeah i got i got sick and it was just a mixture of everything, man. Just constant partying, fucking nervous breakdown, fucking jail. Jail. I'd went to jail like a couple of weeks before, and uh, it was just, you know, it was just like that was it, man. They kept me in there. That's a booze and, will get uh, you as a bunch of jail. So after that, it was like, after uh, you know, I came out, it was like he he got sober. He was like, see me in the hospital and. And it was just like, man, this is a this is a, another chance here. What do you think? You know, not just on music, just in living a a, a life, life right. just yeah, a sober I went, life. I, went and I saw him in the hospital. Truly. I yeah. went and I saw him in the hospital, and I, something clicked in my brain. It's like I'm next. Like this is gonna be me. Like within, I mean, you, I, you feel it. You feel like you're gonna something's gonna happen because you're just drinking so much and. Your body's not yeah. working right, you know. Your heart is not beating right, and you're, you know. And then I went and I saw him, and he's like, <laughs> "Yeah, he was out, man." Like, I was oh out. my god, I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> kind of a light <coughs> chink, yeah. and I was like, "All right, I'm done. That's it." Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, man, and then it was just the the climb, climbing back up the ladder again, you know. Yeah, because it takes a while. Because with alcohol, is, you know, your body is like damaged. You know, years of damage, and it yeah, takes a while. I mean, just being just to just be healthy. The first few, first couple of months there were kind of, you know, once you get past the, the shakes and like you're gonna die, nightmares and yeah, sweats and convulsions and all that kind of shit. Uh, then but, you feel good, but your brain's still like, it's just what needs that. So you're constantly, um, tempted. You're constantly, that's like a major thing in your life is that. Right. Is, is, is so, you know, it's just the pool so strong. 
But yep. once you get past that, then it's like a little easier. Then your brain starts to heal. You know what I mean? So you after, start thinking different. At least different. after six months before the neurons start kind of reconnecting and whatnot, what you've deadened with the alcohol. And so then they start to... That's what gives you seizures is your your nerves are coming back and you're all, you yeah. Know, it's yeah, it's too much. It's too much, yeah. Because wow. your body's used to that sedated, constantly sedated feeling. Yeah, but I was uh, I was determined like this time, like, you know, in the past it was like excuses telling bar owners this or, you know, everyone, whatever. This time it was just like, I'm just going to let my actions speak, you know. I'm, I don't know. I'm not going to put anything on Facebook. Yeah, man, this is going to be the next time. Or I'm just going to be like, you know what, this, just do it. Just keep doing it. And then, you know, people start trusting in you again. Right, right. Because of the tried wolf. Yeah, because at the, at the beginning, even though in your heart you knew, like, this is it, I'm done. People were around you were like, yeah, right, <laughs> yeah. whatever. People were like, sure, right. don't trust that cat. <laughs> hey, you want a beer? Hey, you want a beer? <laughs> yeah. Come would on. People, would people fuck with you? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've had, a, yeah, I mean, I've had people that I thought were close and go, like, yeah, well, yeah, no one's around now. You could have one. And I'm yeah. like, it's like, dude. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> it's like, dude, come on, man. I don't want one. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. So, yeah. But it feels good. Our brains are healing. Woofing. Three years. It takes five years, they say, to to fully heal. Five years for your neurons to grow back and your emotions to be recalibrated and all that kind of stuff. And your organs yeah, to kind of refurbish themselves. When you hit five years, I, me, I consider that day one. Yeah, you know what I mean. That's day one of actually no alcohol influence at all because your body's completely healed from it. Yeah, and so you're like, bam! All right, cool. Now I can start. You know. But yeah, people. Because I used to think when I first started sobriety, I was like, yeah, I'll just do this for like ten years, get healthy. I yeah. could drink again. I'll do it again later. I, when I'm older, I'll do it. You know, you have yeah. that in your mind. It's still so strong, that pull. 
the thought of you drinking later helps you be a little yeah. sober. Yeah. Because like, oh, okay, I'll have it later. I'm not going to, you know, right now I'm being sober. It was like a weird mm. trick, tr- trick my brain. Yeah. But now I'm like, it's, it's just not even a pool at all anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't it's fancy. It's not my fancy. I remember it. And uh, during stressful times, uh, you know, I'm like, man, that was, it was easy to feel numb, you know. It's pretty much what it was. But now with the healing of the brain comes problem solving and stuff like that. So you can deal with your problems a little better. And so you're like, well, I kind of don't need it. You know, I, that, that's there. I feel it. But you know what? I, why don't I just pay this bill? And, the, <laughs> and then you could see the downfall. This, or, yeah. you know. If you start again, you could see the yeah, decline. No, <laughs> no, when you're in that world, there's no future. There is no future. There's, I mean, you. It's not not like you're no long term thinking. It's pure yeah. to the next drink. Yeah. Timing it, because you can't have you can't have so many hours without it. What do you? What like what would you guys offer to a musician or even musicians or or people that know a musician or even not even a musician, just someone in general who's out. You know, mm-hmm. and going through hard times like this, we do know some. Uh, yeah, we've helped. You know, uh, you know, we've put our two cents in for sure. Mm-hmm. I don't go out like I preaching put in, like, anything. Four yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't go out preaching anything. Or right. you know, if they people, no, yeah, people if someone, do what they want. yeah, if, if someone comes, you know, and reaches out, which they do on Messenger or whatever. You know, I've had people that I've just been friends with on Facebook that I've never met. Like, hey, man, can you call me right now? I really need to talk. And, like, you know, I have. I've actually pulled over. I'm like, okay, man. Hey, how's it going? And, hey, you know, I'm like, well, you know, I could tell you this much. And just don't, you know, just just don't drink. (laughs) Just don't do it, it. whatever. Just like. It's easiest thing and it's the hardest thing at the same time. Yeah, you have to want it too. Just you don't have to do it. <laughs> it seems easy, right? Just mm. don't do it. Mm-hmm. But it's also hard, very, very hard. Yeah, because I I remember actually quitting for you know two three months and feeling good and then like getting pissed off. All right, you know whatever. And then it's like that's it. I'm gonna drink. You know. And yeah, because that's that's your brain trying to save itself that that previous brain state trying to save itself because it's hurting and uh now that we're you know brains are healing a little better you know yeah i just tell them you know it's you know it does come down to the minute at a time not one day at a time yeah it's like okay the next five minutes i'm not gonna drink yeah (laughs) you just watch the clock whatever you do okay this hour Get through this hour, man. I could do it. And break then, it down like that. Just you have yeah. to break it down to just literally to the minute, man. And That's then why it gets people better. do that. They say I've been, you know, three months sober, or I've been oh, two weeks sober. I've been, you know what I mean? Because it's a right very, there. it's a prideful thing when you're living that life and going two weeks without. You're like, look at me, mm. I'm fucking yeah. And two weeks, I'm yeah. normal. And, I'm normal and, now. And, and, yeah. be, and beyond that. I deserve that. a drink. <laughs> <laughs> really, right. But beyond that, I mean, the effect that it causes around people, especially whenever you, you know, um, you see the outpouring of love and support uh, of people around you, especially through something like social media, you know, where, yeah. you, where you let people know because then it reinforces some <coughs> people's own journey and their, their addictions and their struggle to fight them off or it does it, recognizing it, that within their own lives or within someone else that loves life, you know? Yeah, it, it does help. You know, I, I only put it up like just on the yearly thing now, you know, but like he was saying back then, it was like, yeah, we got 90 days and, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with drinking. No, okay. Yeah. People drink all the People time. Drink. And it's, yeah. it's uh, you know, we work at bars and they sell beers and, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a, if you know, we used to want to be normal, like a normal drinker, you know, of I'll, I'll a drink. You know what? I'll just have one more. And then, you know, that's it. But we were, our, I guess our personalities or our brains wiring is not. And yeah, that. we used to get so much 
free liquor. Yeah, it's the hardest. It's yeah. the hardest thing about being a musician. Yeah, they're like, I can't. Uh, I can pay you all like 150 bucks, but like a hundred dollars in par. You know. Yeah. It's like what? No, and like just give me like that money in money. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> right. Alcohol. Now that's like that. Not then. We're like, yeah, right. right. Yeah. Like, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Of course. Open bar. What? Okay. Yep. I'll have two drinks, please. Yep. Well, we'd, it'd be open bar until they figured out who we were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like, okay. I know. That's my over at Those two, no more. Yeah. <laughs> the guys at, with the sunglasses, no. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> over at Tiny's, we'd go through a f- fifth in oh, like man. the first hour. Yep. Uh, Easy. First hour. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, we don't play there anymore either. We don't. No, <laughs> there's places that I'd really like to. to play again, and uh, and you haven't, still haven't. That's, yeah. That was going to be one of my questions. Was yeah, yeah. We've uh, burned a lot of bridges, but we also, you know, Have connect ended? reconnected back to we reconnected uh, a lot of them. You know, out yeah. of like the dozen that kind of yeah. There's one. So the curd was like you know we've almost got all but five maybe. There's one at uh, that last that place we played downtown recently, and that bartender used to work at this other bar we used to play at. We still do, which I won't name now. But uh, you know, it was I got kicked out of there when I was on stage because I was so drunk and I fell off and blah blah blah. They're all you'll never play here again, you know. And it was, that definitely hurt because I loved playing there and it was a good place, good money. And then uh, I was telling that bartender, I was like, yeah, man, now we play there and we, psh, they want us, they book us there a year in advance and play there for yeah, New we, Year's. And we always had that um, something about it to where people just dug it. It was just a thing. And, and it was kind of beyond us. It was just to put us together, uh-huh. boom, rock the house. You know what I mean? But uh, even though our personal lives were going crazy. Right. Um, so. It did, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it does take a toll on that. But now that we're back, we're starting to, that same combination is. Yeah, and playing music, still, rehearsing and practicing. Still good. People and, are digging uh, it. Just inspired. I'm, you know, I'm inspired to play. I love to play. You know, yeah. I've always been a showman. I like to play in front of an audience. I just like stage to play, and I'm, I'm trouble. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. Like, <laughs> I just like to play. It doesn't even need to be an audience. I'll just play. Yeah. Now I was I was just speaking about this with uh, with Cesar Bovale the other day about the, if there is a difference between a, a performer and a musician. You know. Oh yeah. Um, an entertainer. An mm-hmm. entertainer. And a musician. That's a better word. Right. That's what I always thought in my mind. Um, was it was being a musician? That I thought that was. That would take you, that would carry you everywhere, but it's not. Yeah. It's the entertainer part the entertainer. that carries you way more than any musical knowledge. It's it's know. package, you know? It's the, the whole deal. It's the whole deal, man. Mm-hmm. Walk in there with confidence, looking good, or what, you know, your, what yeah, your style. You your, yeah, looking good <laughs> with your style and, you it's know. True. It's true. Uh, whatever that it so yeah, shall whatever, be, you know. Whatever your style is, is, you know. It can be whatever, you know. Yeah, attention, you got a, a command to look. The yeah. part, yeah. Right? yeah, Yeah. Well, no, a command to look. So that's like oh, okay. getting people to look at you. Oh, right. okay, okay, okay. Commanding attention just right. by walking in the room. Right. Do you know who does that? John Salmon from... The chat. All the time, bro. All the time with his rings and his freaking mustache. One time we were playing yeah. at Zinc. Perfectly One time we were playing at Zinc. He walks in and it was like, we we're like, he just burned us. I mean, he's, he's not. He's not even <laughs> playing. He's presence. not even playing. <laughs> his presence. His nice hair. His hair burned us. <laughs> we're looking at you, John Sandlin. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, the, there's there's good music scene. We should do a big music fest <laughs> soon. Man, I, I love that idea of, of uh, Gato Fest for sure. Bro, all right. Well, that, <laughs> Gato Fest, Gato. Tell me about Gato Malo and, and what that means to you and what that how that got started. The Gato Malo? Yeah. I don't know how Gato Malo got started. And it was just kind of with Felix y Los Gatos, you know, came like, hey, man, which one's Gato? Hey, Gato. Hey, he's Gato. I got, you know, and then. Was it just the cats? Well, is Felix that, is and that? Los Gatos, they know who Felix is. Yeah. And then, and we're the Gatos. 
Yeah. So we're all gatos. You know we're all I mean? gatos, yeah. But he was known as the gato. So I was like, I just did the gato malo. I think that was kind of when I was, uh, you know, of course I was drinking and I was like, yeah, man, you know, I'm the bad cat, you know, like in whatever, still romanticizing the, the musician thing. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, it's kind of just stuck, you know. And uh, it's on my Facebook, you know, yeah. Gato Malo. So yeah. some people call me Gato. Some people call me Felix. But some people call me bad things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so tell me a little bit about what you guys have coming up. You guys are putting out an album sometime this year. You're looking at the fall, right? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, we're doing the Dos Gatos album soon. We're going to go record yeah. Bill Palmer. We recorded Fe. it one time, but it was like not the wasn't done. It was done like you know very low budget. We're gonna do it really soon. Hmm. So yeah. this one's gonna be, you know, do it right. Because we get a lot of people asking about just our duo project. Oh, hello, is very, yeah, very popular. The people are digging it. We get as many gigs as with that than just it's easy setup and it's fun. I get to do a little bit more strumming and just singing, and just kind of. Songwriter, songwriter stuff. stuff which we could is play cool. a little more jazzy and use a little more. Um, he could be a little more freer and right. Use more progressions, right? Than course, with the band, of course. Because when it's Felix y los Gatos, as as I've heard you and seen you play before, mm -hmm. you'll be sometimes playing on the piano and the accordion. Yeah, and there's a bass player and Melvin or whoever's playing. Mm -hmm. Right. That's and that more music's more dance music, right? Kinda. Right. I look at it as old school dance music. You know what I mean? Like. You, you know, know, I see what play a, some rocks, play rock and you know, grooving vibes, and then boom, a ballad. And be able boom, to like play dances, you know what I mean? Yeah, be able to play to the bar and the kind of people that are in the establishment. You know, like sometimes they want to hear some rancheras or you know, more of a polka feel, say at a casino or whatnot. And you just see the older, you know, some of the older people in the crowd, and you're like, yeah, yeah man, I know these people like this song. And then if they get up, you're like, okay, all right. Yes. We'll play some more of those songs. Yes. Yeah, because each person has their own uh, good abilities that they like. But sometimes just they're younger and they just want, you know, whatever, it's groove, just groove some stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, improvisation is a, um, a large part of our yeah, it's kinda, aesthetic. As well as reading the audience, obviously, as you're talking yeah. about doing, which right. is reading an important the thing to be able to do as a musician but in also general. also treat the song like a head solo head type thing. You right. You, yeah, you guys aren't very uh, um, we uh, masturbatory in that way, but you guys aren't like, let me take, you know, 40 solos, uh, you know, 40 courses of the yeah. solo, right? It's like, no, we're, we're we groove just groove on. a little bit. Yeah. And when, when it's the it. band, I know you jam a little bit more and it opens up yeah. that way as it ought to with the jam band. Yeah, like, that's the vibe of it. With you the know? duo, it's more. Um, right. Yeah, locked in. Yeah, it's almost like you guys have these tight little arrangements that you guys put together. Yeah, you know? we don't. Right, <laughs> right, you're right. You know, it's but not yeah, planned, sometimes but it's we, planned, you know. Yeah. Sometimes we'll groove into something and it just changes. And right, as I'm sure. But yeah, I want to. Yeah. yeah, we're definitely going to record that, and okay. we're waiting for the other album, the full band album, which is was recorded at Blue Cat Studios in San Antonio, mm -hmm. produced by Partial uh, Michael Guetta. Yeah, from the uh, the Mavericks, the band the Mavericks. Yeah, he's him and uh, Tim McDaniel, bass player, produced it. Which is it's an amazing. It's a beautiful studio. I mean, it's a very simple it's, kind of yeah, historical and yeah, it's yeah the people that have recorded there. You know, Flacco and Texas Tornadoes and Los Lobos and Doug Som. There's a place to a recording studio that has famous people that have been there before. It's like a mojo. It's like a vibe. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like Love a that San Antonio vibe. And you're like, wow, you're vibe. here. <laughs> that guy you're like, shit, these to... guys were hanging out here in this bathroom. These guys were pissing right here. You're like, like oh, shit, you know? I better do good. You know? Yeah. I better yeah. With, uh, yeah. bring it. With, um, yes. you know, other recording studios, they don't get an accordion very often. Whereas in San Antonio, that's the they get them all the time. The they get them constantly, so yeah. all day they know how, they know how to work with accordion sounds. It's cool, and it is. It, it, the album's it's really you know polished, other than what we've done in the past, which is one take, two takes. All right, that sounds good. Keep the vibe, right, right, right. Which is cool, you know. But this one's like, all right, let's try this again. Let's try, the, let's try that lead again. And, 
you know it was definitely oh, a really cool polishing it up, right? yeah, yeah it was very good learning experience and you know there's songs in my head that i would like to do that way again mm-hmm. you know it is a different i mean there's a couple different jazz uh musicians that have noted that really all the magic is within the first or the second take right mm-hmm. like they don't go Very past nice. they don't go past that you know because there's not going to be anything past that they're going to keep yeah they would do that keep. i remember them saying all yeah. right well let's do this next song and we'll come back to that we'll one. come back to that because the vibes lose you're losing the vibe on right. that one yeah. right right <laughs> which is cool and try yeah. something else and it, it kind of sucks, you know, when you're in the studio sometimes and you're worrying about, like, the hourly thing. You're like, oh, man. Tell me about it. <laughs> Tell me about it. We can talk about it as musicians. It's, well, we didn't it's really have to worry about it this last Yeah, this <laughs> last time we didn't, so it was kind of a... Yeah, it's not it's being produced Antonio? by us. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's being produced by Michael Guetta and Tim McDaniel. So. Yeah. They were paying <laughs> this, for it? Or yeah, that's yeah, their, so we're their just, project. Yeah. You know, we just were along for the ride, kind of, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when you are paying for the hourly rate, that's another experience for for the <laughs> casual listeners out there it's that like, are musicians. Okay, right, that sounds yeah, good enough. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Think, thinking about the fact that when your time is valuable, as in eighty dollars an hour, yeah. then yes, you are gonna hurry yeah, up. Yeah. You know, or if it's one hundred and twenty dollars an hour, which some studios are, you know, right. hopefully not. But you know, to to be able to record like the old, you know, Rolling Stone albums or Led Zeppelin and stay there like for a month. You oh know, my God. can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. What Just, <laughs> Like, you know? Just kind of hang well, out. Now with these home studios that have pretty much the same, you know, uh, technology as they did, it could be done again. Yeah. Just in a, it's just not one band doing it. It's like a billion bands. Right. Can do. Right. 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 It's the great equalizer. I just went out to uh, Louisiana to record my second album, and it was at a place like that called Studio in the Country. And it was fucking amazing because of the vibes of it. You walk in, there's gold and platinum records. Like, wow. Stevie Wonder recorded there. Yeah. Kansas recorded that famous song, Carry On My Wayward Son. It was like, the vibes were just everywhere. And you, we bought the, or, you know, we bought the whole package of being able to stay there overnight because it's an hour and a half outside of New Orleans. So you, you sleep at this, uh, at this house that has a ton of rooms, can house probably like a 10 or 11 piece band. Right. And, uh, it was tight, man, to be able to sleep there, walk over to the studio in the morning, go back to sleep there the next day. We only had two days in the studio, but I mean, even then, they, to get to work in in a space like that is spectacular. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Yes, you are looking at the watch every second to be like, hmm. okay, let's move along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you know you have to have the songs ready and ready. You know, you have to know what you want before you go into the studio. It's something a lot of people don't think about. And I, that was my biggest learning experience with this last one. Yeah. So I didn't have a producer that went in there uh, directing the session. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, driving the ship, driving the, the train. I think this last time I, I did, I had, you know, my big iPad. And I was like, I'm going to make sure because previous times that it happened. I didn't have the vocals right. And I was trying to just improv. And they're all, just say what you did last time. I was like, I don't remember what I said last time. So right. it's better to have, you know. That shit worked out. It's good to have it worked out. But yeah, we're hoping to have it released this year and it's going to be good, man. And move on to the next one. Let's yeah, keep recording. I do a lot of them. And I want to record more. I want to record a lot more. I definitely am going to throw my head in there to say that I'm going to record an album with you guys down the road somewhere. We'll get the two of you in the cool, studio. Man. and to some would, kind of like you know Nuevo Mexicano something col- cool. meets Colombiano I mean, you know, cumbia meets that would be really cool I we've been doing a lot of cool cumbias dude. you know our own style of cumbias dude. but uh as Fred calls them cumbias <laughs> <laughs> cumbios wait one of character. them there cumbias <laughs> it looks like what's the uh, what's the character uh, what funny character oh. Yosemite Sam yeah, he's kind of Yosemite Samish. Very much so, man. Yeah, especially when he wears those tights and he <laughs> very short and wears that big hat and his mustache and the way he talks. Yeah, just like waiting for him to pull the shotgun out of his car, you know. <laughs> oh, he, but he pulls a guitar. He out. has one. Yeah, he pulls like, a guitar, or a banjo, or something, out, right? No, it's like a forty-four. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> All right, yeah. so so gentlemen, some. Uh, we're definitely going to get to play some music here in just a second, but uh, something I love bringing up to people in general, um, and I guess I can substitute the word music for it, but what, is, um, what does music mean in, in your lives? Like, what does it mean, well, you know? It's, it's our faith. 
it's our it's my it's my religion yeah. it's my whole you know like other people would think of a religion it's healing Music is like that for me yeah it's healing and for the for the family you know there's there's family members and that work blue collar job do this and but we're the artist and I see some of the older musicians that I've always looked up to and they're still like that accordion player from up north I forgot his name but uh he you know he'll haul wood he's like in the 70s haul wood and then he'll do a gig and then like he just he's lived yeah. his life doing just what exactly kind of what you want to do you know and that's we, what I like what we have in store for us hopefully yeah just just blessed to to meet so many different people in all aspects of life you know from down and to and to be a part of the local scene you know every musician has dreams of becoming big everywhere but we really have a want to you know be in new mexico we love new mexico, new mexico yeah. history and music scene history yeah look at bill hearn and uh you know the hearns that's they, they, cool there then it's the new mexico it's it's definitely it's in our blood for sure yeah, man. I used to think that, uh, you know, John Coltrane, when he'd play his solos, especially when he got into that later, you know, more freer stuff, that he was like, it's like speaking in tongues with your instrument. You know what I mean? It's like a... The zen. It's like a total zen. Your mind is totally experience. clear and your yeah. hands are just moving and it's just going. Yeah, when your mind is clear, that's the spot. And then I used to think that the sounds that are coming out are the exact sounds that are needed to come out to, to heal do people things in the universe or whatever certain vibrations yeah and you have to keep your mind perfect and quiet and and then let it flow you can not you see you know it doesn't happen very often you know but it can hmm. i love it i appreciate you guys coming on our top music and talking to me hmm. and sharing a little bit about your story um, with your permission, maybe I'll play some old music of y'all's as, as uh, maybe the intro, but we'll play right now a little bit of music so the people can get a little taste of some stuff right now. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Oh. This is the podcast. I'm with Felix and David. Oh, Mr. David forgot to say hello to his beautiful lady. So I'm going to say hello for him. I we thank you. Man. I am. <laughs> well, thank you for listening to this episode of Art Talk Music. With the two baddest gatos around. <laughs> Thank you.
Tripping, man, I'm tripping. <laughs> I know we are. I'm just giving him a little. I'm testing his vocals. It's just the weather. It's WD 40, those suckers. Take me back home. About right there on my vocals. I don't want to go up to Europa. Baby, me and you at night. Say it ain't so. Honey, I don't want to go up to Europa. Baby, me and you tonight. Up to Europa, baby, me and you tonight. 